All right, my friends, welcome Synth Wavers, Alonzo here. Today, on this beautiful Costa Rican evening, and whatever time it is from wherever you're watching in the world, I'm going to walk you through a short piece I made today. It's fresh out of the oven using a technique I call direct influence composition, which is method number two in my five ways to start a synthwave track. Hey, Wolf's Den, Peter, PF Darkside, thank you very much for being here, guys. And as a reminder, the Synthwave Idea Machine Bootcamp is going to kick off this Monday, April the 8th. And in this bootcamp, you're going to learn not only the method that I'm going to show you today, but four more um, ways to generate ideas for your Synthwave tracks so you can kiss writer's block and boredom goodbye whenever you're running out of ideas or if you're tired of always creating and writing the same kind of track over and over again this boot camp is gonna do away with all of that and if this feels or sounds like it's something that's interesting that you'd like to participate simply visit the link in the description of this video and get in touch with me awesome and before i forget if you're watching this after the Bootcamp has come and gone. Don't worry, still follow the link in the description and join the waitlist. You'll find a button there to send me an email message. All righty, my friends. So let's get into it. Let's see where we are. All right, all right, all right. So today is going to be a little different than some other days. We're not going to be making music live, but I'm going to walk you through, like I mentioned, this this piece that I created today. Now, uh, the way that I created this piece is using what I call direct influence composition. These are the terms that I have come up with that I use to describe different things. You know, if you are familiar with Synthwave Dojo, you know that I have different terms or my own terms for almost everything related to music production. And direct influence composition, it's simply analyzing the style of another producer, uh, another artist, an album, a track, or a substyle, making note of certain elements that you find interesting and reusing them. So it's taking and borrowing ideas and inspiration from other people. And before you think about it, this is not stealing. If you think of it, whenever uh, a filmmaker makes a film, whenever a painter paints, to some degree, they're always um, using the art uh, that came before them to add to it, right? So there's no really 100% um, totally original way to create a synthwave track or a film or whatever. You're always using your um, the masters, your heroes as reference. And in this case, in direct influence composition, we're, like I said, we're going to pick and choose certain elements and use them directly in our tracks. And obviously, we're not going to remake someone else's track. We're going to pick and choose certain elements and then blend them with our own elements to create a completely new composition. So for today, um, I, I use the direct influence from the Midnight. Also, if, you've, uh, if you're familiar with some of the videos that I've been putting out over the past couple of weeks, uh, I've been going very deep and heavy into the Midnight. So I said, why not reuse some of the parameters or some of the things that I find interesting from their music and try to come up with a piece of piece of my own kind of in the same ballpark okay so the elements that i was uh, that i picked to use as direct influence for my composition were the tempo at 148 bpm and i'm going to show you um, a couple of things in a second the progression that you see here uh, g minor g minor d flat major and e flat minor uh, e flat major is also straight from a um, chord progression by the midnight as I talk in a video that I made like a week ago called Five Iconic Riffs by the Midnight, um, the Midnight tend to create these riffs where they have, where they use what I call uh, triad over root approach, or they create a riff by using pedal tones from a triad, etc. So I wanted to use that technique in my piece as well. The Midnight, they're also very characterized by uh, using very meaty kick and snares. Kick and snares have a lot of punch, a lot of body and weight to them. 
and definitely they sound different from your typical Lin and 707 and uh, Simmons drums. They do use some of those sounds, but if you listen carefully, at least during the fir uh, on the first albums, their drum sounds are not really like retro drums, like straight out of a 707. They, they, it, there's something more going on there. And also, the Midnight, they use the synthesizer Diva, the VST, a lot. So I always, uh, I also wanted to take this opportunity to use plenty of Diva. So, a few weeks ago, I made a video called uh, The Midnight Chord Progressions Demystified. And I'm showing an Excel sheet or a Google sheet that I put together analyzing some of their um, most renowned tracks from, from their, uh, the early uh, stage of their career. And here you'll see the tracks, specifically Los Angeles, Sunset, Jason, etc. And I have the tempo here, I have the key, whether it's in a major or a major or minor key, and the specific progression translated into Nashville number system, which is um, similar to Roman numerals with a couple of differences, right? So going back to the parameters that I chose, I picked the tempo of 148 BPM for me. I don't write synthwave in such a fast tempo so it was a kind of a challenge for me to do this and i took this straight from their track gloria now this chord progression in nashville number system six minor six minor four and five that one i plucked straight from days of thunder now days of thunder is in c minor and my piece is in g minor so i just uh, took the same chords the relationship between the chords and just um translated or um uh, uh, went from or or what's the, <laughs> the right term i forgot transpose <laughs> i always get it mixed up with translated transposed it from c minor to g minor all right so let's get into this before i walk you through all of the elements all of the parts and all of the processing let me play you the very quick and dirty piece that I created today. It lasts for like a minute and a half or something. It's a very quick and dirty arrangement. And let's listen. All right, all right, all right. As you heard, I was going for a very the midnight kind of style. Again, taking inspiration from from some of those elements that I have already mentioned. Now, this kind of arrangement is what I call a um, an atom, such as uh, what matter is made of. You have neutrons, protons, that kind of thing, and the atom, which to me is a precursor of the concept of a, the basic kata, which which is more of a a strict form made up of 40 bars. Here's just very loose, quick and dirty, just throwing things together to create, um, to take an eight bar loop and give it a little bit of time. I'm not too concerned about the transitions and and um, the effects, etc. This is just, think of it as a, um, as the storyboard when you're, uh, if you're producing a movie or if you're trying to 
to pitch a movie to a um a, to a studio etc you tell them okay, okay so the movie is about this the, the guy the guy that does this and this happens etc so it's just a, like a, a tiny snapshot of what the movie is or what the book is to get people excited so this is what this kind of arrangement um, is about all right so now uh, now let's get down into the nitty-gritty this thing started with a main stack that sounds like this All right, so taking this step by step, we have four or five parts. Bass, that's one part. The drums are part number two. Even though we have various drums, I consider them as one layer or one part in my arrangement or one layer in the stack. Ergo, the name main stack. So two layers. The third layer is this riff. The fourth layer these stabs the fifth layer what I call this accent synth which plays kind of a response to some of the stuff that came before it and element number six this sax guitar And I call it sax guitar. <laughs> this is very curious because down in this octave range, this kind of sounds like a sax, but when I play it in a higher octave like this, in the mix, to me, it sounds like a guitar. In any case, funny stuff. All right, so when putting this piece together, I like I like to say, my main stacks, I like to have four or five or six elements, not more than that. Why? A few reasons. The more stuff you put into your main stack, if I had added four or five elements more to get to a total of, let's say, 10 or 12 or 11, which I could have easily done, then I would have had a tendency to try, the, to, try to cram them all in when creating my arrangement. And yeah, this is an, an atom. A quick and dirty arrangement this is not even a full-length track but if i had tried to use everything this quick and dirty arrangement this snapshot this vignette uh, would have lost focus right so that's one of the um the main reasons why i don't like to start with um, too many layers in my stack the second reason is that as i work on turning this main stack into a full-length track i like to um be surprised and I like and look forward to the magic of discovery during musical composition. Meaning that I know that with four or five or six elements, it's not going to be enough to, um, to sustain the, the interest over a full-length track. So most likely, yeah, I'm going to need two or three additional sounds, maybe even four. But I like to leave that to the point during the arrangement process when I need them. I like to discover them during that moment in time later right not at the front of the composition process i don't know right now what i need right these are the basic elements that i came up with for sure the bass drums some kind of lead those are my three that always make it into a main stack and i could add two more um parts for harmonic support sometimes it's chords it could be a pad or it could be an arpeggio right but like i said i'd like to um uh, to leave open and leave some room for the magic of discovery during the arrangement process and i'll and I, i'll only know what i need what kind of element i need once i get to that place during the arrangement right and the third reason why i like to keep my main stacks very light like this very um, thin or shallow is that the more elements you have in your arrangement in your mix the harder it is to create not only the arrangement, but the harder it is to mix and master, okay? If you're a master mixer and a master mastering engineer, you can handle 60, 70, or 80 tracks any day of the week with your eyes closed. But most of us synthwave producers who aren't professional mixing engineers, who aren't professional mastering engineers, 
the more tracks we have in our productions, the harder it is to create the arrangement, mix, and master, because you now have to contend with not only, uh, let's say, not five elements going on at the same time, but seven or eight or nine, um, you have to really be very, um, let's say, very extreme with the boosts and cuts and the filtering, and you have stuff piling on each other, and your lead, it can't poke through, and yeah, it can't poke through because you have chords, you have a counter melody, you have a guitar, you have a sax, you have pad, you have like so much stuff going on that it's almost impossible to have that single lead or that important thing shine through and poke through. Again, this is why, at least when you're a beginner, I really recommend you take things, um, uh, your main sax not to have more than four or five elements, and in your productions, try not to have more than, uh, I don't know, six or uh, six, seven, eight, or nine synths at the same time in the production, right? Of course, some stuff shows up in the intro, then never comes back, etc. But at the same time, like in the same section, try not to have too much stuff, uh, four or five or six elements, maybe. All right, so with that out of the way, let's dive into each individual element. So this is our bass pattern, like I mentioned, this is a chord progression in G minor, and I'm simply following, let me bring it up, pull it up again, the progression is G minor, G minor, D flat major, E flat major, and I'm just playing simple eighth notes and playing the root notes of those chords in my bass line. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. As easy as pie. Now, this is a patch that I created in D.Va. And I started with, if you have D.Va, D.Va is a monster of a synth. I started out with a Jupe 8 or the Jupiter 8 preset. And it is strictly or uh, simply a fat line bass kind of patch. The fat line bass patch, in case you don't know it, is a preset very famous in the Korg Polysix synth. There's a VST version. Time Cop and plenty of other guys use this kind of bass patch on all of their tracks, and I think I use it on 99.9% .9 of my tracks. And I'm always remaking this patch on every synth that I can get my, my hands on, and I find that um, it doesn't sound quite right on every synth. I don't know why, but something to do with the stacking of the oscillators and the, the detuning and the envelopes, that it, it, it sounds... It sounds good on any synth, but it doesn't sound great. It depends. And on D.Va, it sounds really, really great. And here, in terms of effects, I have EQ just uh, cleaning up the mud in the low end and here in the low mids. I have an optical compressor, just making sure that the bass sound sounds uh, very dense, it has body, and it doesn't fluctuate in amplitude. And then I have this EQ in side mode, just taking away the low frequencies below 120 Hz from the sides. That's something that I always do, I don't like to have, even though I have um, a wide bass patch, the sides, I don't like them to have almost any bass. Great. Next up, let's talk about the drums. Let's take him one by one. The main beat is super simple. Kick on the one and the what? One and the three. Snare on the two and four. Hi-hats playing eighth notes. And an open hat every what? At the end of every bar. Super simple stuff. Really, beginner stuff, even. In terms of the sounds that I'm using here, the samples, let me pull up my drum VST. All of these samples are from the Akai XR10 sample pack, or from the Akai XR10 drum machine, which you can find free online various places. This is our kick. This is the snare with some reverb, which I'll get into in a few. This is our hat, open hat, claps, crash, toms. The toms do have that retro Simmons 
mesh toms, as I like to call them, kind of sound. Tambourine. But the kick and the snare, they're kind of punchy and heavy. And they have a, I would say, modern contemporary sound. They don't sound retro like Lynn or 707 or Simmons drums. And this is characteristic of, of the Midnight. They have very meaty drums. All right, let's take a look at the processing of these three elements. So the kick, I have a little bit of EQ boosting the low end. A cut at 250 hertz to get rid of the mud tubbiness. And a cut here at 3.7K to get rid of some high frequencies that I didn't like. And a compressor giving this thing punch without the compressor with it's now a very meaty hit and in case you didn't know this vca compressor by soft tube is free at the time of the recording of this video i think it's going to be free for like i don't know maybe a couple of days or a week if you don't have this compressor which is awesome it's modeled after the dbx 160 which is a legendary compressor for drums and for a lot of uses head over to soft tubes website and get yourself a free copy of this VCA compressor, which is just amazing. All right, that's a kick. And let's take a look at the snare. The snare has a high pass filter. I'm boosting the bottom of the snare to give it more meat. I'm cutting some of the mid frequencies. And I'm boosting a little bit of the highs. I'm also using the VCA compressor to give it some punch and weight without it sounds kind of flat now this compressor gives it a lot of slap and I'm using the glow reaver plugin using a non lin algorithm of course you can use whatever reverb you have around this is the snare without the reverb super lackluster and, and boring right hey stargazers The drums I'm using are from the Akai XR10 drum machine. You can get these samples, if I'm not mistaken, from the KB6 website. Uh, you could get them there for free, or maybe you have to make a donation of 10 bucks or 20 bucks or whatever to get like six gigabytes of samples. Um, if you can get them for free from that site, awesome. If you can donate 10 or 20 bucks, I'm, I'm not affiliated with them. I'm just, a, uh, I just have their, their bundle of free stuff. And um, it's really great. And this Akai XR10 has a lot of really punchy, meaty uh, drums with, uh, with weight. All right. So that's the snare and the hat. I just have some very high, high pass filter. I really like to filter most of the lows and even most of the mids of my hi-hats. Otherwise, I tend to find especially drum machine samples like the Lin, the 707, and uh, some of those other ones. The, the hi-hats, they sound like super clunky. They have a lot of low mids and sometimes a lot of low end and the mids have a, a lot of clunkiness that I don't like. So I tend to typically high pass them all the way up to around 1K or even higher. I don't know if you can hear that, but I'm just soloing what's been filtered out, and I hear a lot of low mids. And then I'm boosting the, the high end to give them more of a crisp. Without. With. Awesome. And I'm sending the hats to a room reverb. And this room reverb that I'm using for my drums is from the plugin Glow. Again, any plug-in with reverb that you have, your stock plug-in will work just fine. I'm just using a room algorithm here in this case. All right, this is very punchy and it really gets us into the into a the midnight um, ambience or style very quickly. We're pretty much there. Especially if you think about tracks like Gloria, Days of Thunder, and what was the other one? Um, and Jason, pretty much this is that kind of sound. Excellent. So that was the basic groove. Again, it's just very simple. Kick on the one and three, snare on the two and four, and a hi-hat, close hi-hat playing 
eighth notes with an open hi-hat at the end of uh, every bar. Then we have a crash. <laughs> Nothing out of the ordinary, it just works. And I have a clap here. Kind of just accenting the groove. Very simple stuff. Nothing out of the ordinary. With reverb, the same um, room reverb that I used on the hats. It's a shared reverb between all my drums. And I have a tambourine pattern here. I don't remember if it was Jason or Days of Thunder. One of those had um, some tambourine accents. So I wanted to incorporate that into my own piece. However, I just added delay because I felt that I liked the kind of bouncy sound of, um, of applying delay to the tambourine. All right, and this very cool drum fill. <laughs> very 80 sounding, the mesh toms sound that I love so much. Right, so this is the bass and the drums. Yeah, possibly the hardware version of the uh, Kai XR10 is cheap. It's not as coveted as some of the Lin and 707 or the Simmons drums. Well, Simmons drums are not drum machine. In any case, yeah, it's one of those hidden gems um, that I that I use every now and then. And certainly for this kind of sound that we're going for, certainly they work really, really well. All right, so that's the foundation of our short track. I'm going to get into the arrangement and some of the effects and some of the, the, the automations that I did in a second. I'm just uh, going through the foundation of the piece. Now let's talk about the synths. Like I said, the parameters that I set for myself, I, I wanted to steal or reuse some kind of pedal riff that the Midnight always uses, right? And a pedal riff is something simple. Let's say this is, I'm just playing here uh, Diva doesn't have a um, keyboard. Okay, let me open this. Okay, here, if I play a C major chord, a pedal riff is just simply finding notes here around this position, and I come up with a pattern like so. And I play that same pattern on top of a chord progression that changes chords, right? And that, uh, it's called pedal because the notes don't don't change once the chord changes. And this kind of thing is not only used a lot by the Midnight, but pretty much every Dream Waver out there like Time Cop and Marvel 83, all of those guys, they tend to use these kind uh, these pedal riffs a lot. And here is the, um, the quintessential pedal riff is the Voice of Summer arpeggio from um, Don Henley, like this. Hold on, I just botched it. There. I'm playing the, the rhythm incorrectly, but it's the same principle. You just take three or four notes and, uh, and find some kind of pattern that you like and play it over your bass line or your, your arrangement. And in this case, our piece is in G minor, so I'm playing some of the G minor notes. Here you see, um, here's G that I played here. Then we have B flat, which is played a lot in this um, in this pedal riff. Then we have D, which I'm not playing, and the other notes. Let me see. We have B, A, which is the um, the second of the G minor chord. We have F, that is the seventh. And it's just very simple. The seventh and the second give the riff a very dreamy, melancholy, wistful vibe. And the pattern is pretty much a two bar pattern, just with a slight variation towards the end. And that's a great thing to do. Even though you have a pattern like this, it sounds good and I could play the same pattern for four bars, I always find ways to introduce just a little bit of variation. So the, the first time that the pattern plays, or, or, or let's say when it come, it turns around on bar number two, we play this note, but on bar number four, instead of playing this C, I play G. And 
so our, our ears do pick that up so we we can hear that it's not the same pattern it's very simple and you can experiment with this technique and just move the notes around find different rhythms with three or four notes you can create like uh, an endless variation of uh, pedal riffs like this and it's just a matter of trying out a few notes until you find something that you like and i do recommend um experimenting with having notes that play on the downbeat and a nice balance of notes that don't play on the downbeat so it doesn't sound mechanic right notes that don't play on the uh on the downbeat that's called syncopation so a, a try to incorporate a little bit of syncopation here and there will do wonders for your pedal riffs and always try always try to find um, places where you speed up the pattern or give it a little bit of space right try not to create a pattern where the distance between the notes is always the same for example you see here we have a distance we have a larger here's the same distance here we have a short distance short distance longer distance and so on and so forth all right enough of that pattern this is a diva preset from the the midnight sound bank for diva and I think I may have changed a few parameters here and there. It's very dreamy. Typical the midnight stuff. And of course I have some EQ seriously cutting out the low mids and the lows. As well as the high end. I'm also using the same, well, a different BCA compressor. This is modeling an LA-2A compressor. Any compressor that you have will work just fine. I just like, for certain um, use cases, a very simple one-knob compressor, like for compressing my synths and some other elements, like a one-knob compressor is always my uh, go-to choice. And of course, a little bit of delay will go a long way into um, breathing some life into this piece, or this part, rather. Cool. And I'm sending this synth into a shared reverb. Okay, let me get this closer. For my synths, a approach that I use most of the time is setting up some kind of hall reverb or very large room reverb, and then send different amounts from all of my synths into that shared reverb. In this case, I'm just using Glow, a Hall algorithm. It sounds really good. That was just a, the verb bus for my sins. All right, easy peasy stuff. Nothing out of the ordinary when it comes to that synth. Next up, we have... Let me get rid of this. We have these stabs. All right, I see some questions there in the chat. Do I prefer Diva or Arturia? That's a good question. I think um, synths are just tools. And personally, I tend to use more of the Arturia stuff than anything else. I don't know, I, I'm just very familiar with them. But I have made a pact with myself or made an effort to get to learn Diva more and use it more because I, I, I'm guilty of this, but I have so many synths that I forget which sense I have um, so just comparing quality side by side I would say that either of them is a great choice either the Arturia V collection or Diva now of course with Arturia V collection you get 30 synths right it's a, a ton of synths and if you get it on a Black Friday discount you can get the whole thing for like $300 which is like a hundred dollars more than the full price Diva so if, if you can get it at a discount like that, then to me, it's a no-brainer. For me, it's a no-brainer. Just go with a V collection. And now the other thing is that, again, the it, Diva sounds awesome, spectacular. But if you're a beginner and you're not too familiar with sound design, for example, um, and if you want a Juno sound or a Jupiter sound or an OBXD or a Mini Moog kind of sound, um, you're kind of lost trying to get that with Diva because if you don't know the, the architectures of those synths, 
then it's uh, diva can be confusing in selecting the envelopes and the filters etc right it does have some presets to get you there closer right but if you have the v collection you want a juno sound you just fire up the juno if you want the jupiter you just fire up the jupiter right right in front of you you don't know you don't have to know the architecture and, and start tweaking it to get it there and which is the, th the thing that happens with diva but if you know your way around synths and you know those um, emulation synths or uh, the original classics then with diva you can practically mimic e everything any subtractive synthesizer you can do on diva and it will sound gorgeous and i see another question here about kavinsky well i did a tutorial on kavinsky like six months ago or a year i think it's called kavinsky main stack i remade um what's it called night call <laughs> and go and watch that and i think i i, I did it i really uh, did my homework and recreated that to the best of my ability and i think it turned out really well so if you're interested in night call go and watch that video and i think in the future i'm going to be doing a deep dive into kavinsky kind of like i'm doing in um, uh, into the midnight right now in a few months from now i'm going to go deep in kavinsky and talk about the bass patterns the chord progressions the drum sounds etc to get a a realistic kavinsky sound but for now go and watch that night call video all right, so these stabs are simple chords from the progression G minor, D flat major, E flat major rather, and F major. Nothing out of the ordinary, and they're just I'm just playing them in root position, not even any um, any kind of inversions. And the sound that I'm using, like all my other synth sounds for today, is diva. And this is also from the the midnight sound bank i think i may have tweaked this a lot especially the decay because i i did want the length of the stabs to have a certain duration and die out before the next hit and um, the the raw preset it was too long or too short i don't remember but i had to tweak the length to fit the music and um of course, I am filtering out a lot of the low end because I don't need it. I just want these chord stabs that in uh, in in my main stack and in my arrangement, once I have all of the other stuff going, I don't need the low mids and the low. So that's why I filter them out. And I'm using just a um, a one knob compressor, again, a an LA-2A emulation for, for the stabs. Just to make sure that they're very solid and that they don't jump out at me on every on every stab and in this case i'm using replica or this delay unit not to um to delay the signal as normally you would but just to create a Haas effect or a stereoizing effect where you have the dry signal panned left without delay and then just one repeat to the other side at um 20 milliseconds or just a little bit um, higher than that to give the impression of a sound becoming stereo. So this is what I call the poor man stereo, the stereoizing effect. It's called the Haas effect uh, due to a Dutch physicist, or I don't know what he was, and if, if they were even Dutch. In any case, look it up, the Haas effect. And um, you can use this to stereoize uh, hi-hats, to stereoize synths and leads, etc. And in, in in this piece, because I have my lead and some other stuff in the middle, I didn't want the stabs to be right smack in the middle of my stereo panorama. I wanted them to be on the sides. If this is right, what you hear. There's a big hole in the middle where I have my kick, my snare, my other uh, important stuff. Great. Next up, we have what I call the accent synth. It's just very simple notes, like four notes from the scale. The thing I'm using here, this is G, B flat. So it's note from the uh, from the G minor chord, which is the tonic of the of the key of this uh, of this piece, plus some other non chord tones. And the first round of this accent pattern, it goes down. But then to introduce a little bit of variation on the second time around. They go up, and I'm using different notes. It sounds very cool. It's very simple. And this is Diva. 
preset called Dolphin Dreams. Still the, the Midnight preset sound bank. Don't remember if I changed it or edited it. And I'm just using here... Some delay to give it more balance. Make it more interesting. And finally, we have our sax guitar. Alright, so this, I'm playing very simple notes. And I'm playing sustained notes with uh, some passing notes in between. Because I, I did want this to feel kind of like a, not a guitar solo, but something epic. Where, uh, like, the guitar player is, um, uh, imagine the player on stage with a spotlight shining on them. Like, taking their solo stance. That's kind of what I wanted. And I'm using my pitch bend and modulation wheel to introduce a little bit of vibrato and bending. So that was vibrato. And this is pitch bend to give life to the part. Electric guitar, or simulated guitar, if you just play or program straight notes without any bends and without any vibrato, it sounds super plasticky, unnatural, and boring. So, if you want to play something that kind of realistically could get close to a, an electric guitar or a sax, you have to use, um, uh, what's the, the term for this? It's not gestures, but <laughs> it slipped my mind. Uh, articulations is the, the word that I was looking for. There are certain things that guitarists and sax players do, right? A guitar player, for the most part, they would never stay on a note like this. It's super boring they would do some vibrato if they know that they're going to stay on that note for a while. They give it vibrato like that, or they bend it upward or downward. Obviously, you need to be careful that you're playing in tune, but um, again, vibrato and pitch bending will breathe a lot of life into your guitar and sax, into your fake guitar and fake sax parts. Otherwise, they're going to sound super boring if you don't use these techniques. And for getting a little bit of a guitar sound, you don't have to be um, uh, super complex with it. In this case, this is just a, a default or init patch. And it's only one sawtooth waveform with chorus. That's pretty much it. And then you just uh, fire up any guitar um, effect, pedal, or cab emulation you have in your, in your DAW and just find something that works. Something like uh, a name with the 80s or solo or high gain, those tend to work very well for this kind of thing. And of course, we have some EQ to get rid of a lot of the high end to make it smoother. And of course, delay. Without delay, it would have been hideous. Awesome. And some EQ to chop off some high end and low end and a compressor. Pretty much that's it. So once more, this is our main stack. This is what we started out with. All right, now in terms of turning this main stack into a quick and dirty arrangement of around a minute and a half or so, the technique that I used was very simple. If you have watched some of my other videos where I, uh, like the Let's Make Synthwave, where I create a main stack like I just, but then during the second half of the show or the episode, I turn it into a 40 track arrangement, I follow like a very precise and strict structure of eight bars intro, eight bars verse, eight bars um, uh, chorus, eight bars bridge, and eight bars outro every time. 
in this case, this is not a, a basic kata or an, or an atom. This is an atom, which is more of a loose feeling structure. And I just simply start at the beginning and pretty much just take a pick. Like, um, okay, I want to start out with a couple of elements. I don't want to start out with the lead. I could have, but let me just start out with the riff. So let me take this section by section. And this riff is being filtered in with automation. Now, I'm not using a dedicated filter plugin for that. That's straight from the synth. It's uh, here, the envelope amount. You see it turning as time goes by. All right. And very simply, I just said, okay, I want my riff to play for eight bars. Let's drop something else. What feels right? Let's uh, have the, the, the riff go on its own for four bars. Then let's drop something in. I just came up with the idea of the bass. Here I have a crash and the steps. Um, it's a good idea sometimes when you're adding new stuff, not just add one or two or two. Like they say, good things come in twos or threes. <laughs> in any case, here I decided to add two elements, um, the bass and the stabs. And definitely it helps without the stabs. It's not wrong, but it's like, oh man, it's lacking a little bit of energy, right? These tabs, they give us a lot of movement. Right. And of course, I left this gap here to introduce a little bit of tension because when you're listening to this, you're like, okay, so what's coming next? It's a little bit of an awkward silence. With the mandatory 80s style <laughs> drum fill. All right. And that takes us to the next section. So the intro, easy peasy, just a few elements. And the only thing that I automated was the filter um, envelope amount in the synth riff or the main riff. All right, let's take a look at section B. All right, I see some great questions coming in here. One of them, do you tune your toms so they're in tune to the key of the track? As a drummer of over for over 20 years, um, you don't need to tune the drums to your track. If the drums have some very strong um, tones or some very um, sustaining tones, they may interfere and you may want to do that. But for the most part, I, I don't remember if I have ever tuned my drums or my tums in this case. It's not really necessary to go with that. Having said that, be careful with the cowbell because the cowbell, I do find it helpful to tune it to the key of your track because otherwise it can sound, uh, it can sound like it's, uh, uh, it's out of tune or the, the section doesn't sound good. And for whatever reason, it's the, the cowbell. So that one you need to tune. And I have a video called Percussion Masterclass, something like that. Look it up on, on YouTube or on my website, synthwithdojo.com. And during that masterclass, I show you how to tune your cowbells and some other elements. But just to, um, to answer your question, no, I never um, tune my toms. I don't think it's necessary. I've never run into the situation where, where it's needed. And I see another question here. Um, Let's see, guitar, ba, 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 ba. I wonder how Melodyne would work for giving the guitar a more humanized sound. Yeah, you can play with slides and a very quick, um, you can use portamento in, in your synth as well. And there's another technique. For example, if you set your synth 
I forgot to mention that definitely when you're playing guitar or at least lead parts like this, make sure that it's in, uh, hold on, yeah, the sax guitar, that it's um, set, up, set up as mono, mono, so the notes don't overlap. And the other thing is that if you set it to legato, you can play tapping like this. Which is very cool. So you also have that option of uh, changing the patch to legato mode. It sounds very cool. which also sounds very realistic. And there's a, a, a whole slew of other techniques that can uh, make it sound more realistic if that's what you're going for. But for the most part, if it's buried in the mix or if it's just a, uh, a lead like this, for the most part, you don't need it to be super realistic. Uh, you can turn to the Midnight for Inspiration. For example, the Comeback Kid, the main lead, the solo is not a guitar. They could have hired a guitar, but they didn't. It's just a synth, um, a keyboard, uh, player playing that thing or pro or, or, or that was programmed. I don't know how they did it But it, yeah, it's a it's a synth. It's not a guitar So you don't necessarily always have to use a real guitar or try to get it to 100% sounding realistic All right, so section B I'm just like getting all the all the other parts in for the most part except the the guitar So once we go from the from this intro into the B section Pretty much everyone else is playing in here. Now we hear the clap pattern. Cool. And the accent is just playing here a couple notes at the end of the section, not throughout the whole piece like it was doing here. And also, I don't have... I ha do have the claps here, but I don't have the tambourine. I left the tambourine for when... Uh, the, the next section comes in that needs a little bit more energy. And I programmed a different drum fill. <laughs> it sounds pretty nice. All right, and there's zero automation in this section. Next section, more of the same, I just added, what did I add here? Now the accents are playing their full pattern and we have the tambourine, so it should feel a little bit more energetic. All right, I see a great question here. When adding gaps, is it adding an extra bar or just cutting one off? Great question. It depends, and you can do whatever feels right to you for the particular track. In this case, what I did is I chopped off the end of this bar, like so. Like this bit here, I chopped it off, so I cut the bass short. I cut this riff short and this other thing short, I think. Um, so in this case, I cut it short, but for example, here at the end of the piece, I stop it here, not short, but at the bar, and um, you can try it either way. It works either way, depends on what you're going for, but there's no hard and fast rule like saying, yeah, you always have to cut it short or cut the, the, the full bar. It depends. Either of them could work. I feel like... Cutting it short feels more abrupt, like more tense, maybe. Like more surprise, because you're expecting it there. As opposed to just uh, playing the full bar and just um, stopping on the downbeat, it, uh, it also introduces a, an awkward pause, an awkward silence, but I think it's not so tense as starting or stopping before. Uh, in any case, just try it out. There's no hard and fast rule about that. So C section, the same as B, just with the almost the rest of our elements, and that gets us to the D section, which is where we finally experience our sax 
guitar. Oh, I notice here that since I consider this section to be, let's say, the main section or the chorus, I took out the accents oops, that had been playing on the section before because I didn't want to I didn't want the guitar to be competing against so much stuff that was going on, right? So I took out the accents. Oh, and something that I forgot to mention is that the main riff, I automated the filter cutoff throughout the sections. So here at the end of the intro, it's almost full bandwidth. It's full bandwidth during this section, but on the other sections, I filter it out. And we, when we have the electric guitar, it's very filtered out because, again, I don't want it to compete compete with the electric guitar. Same principle or same deal with um, what was it? The the accents. I wanted to clean up this section a little bit so the guitar has more room to breathe. Cool. So that's pretty much it for that section. And then the next section, since I'm just doing a quick and dirty arrangement here, I just wanted to introduce a little bit of tension, a moment of tension, not necessarily a bridge or a full breakdown, because I, I was going for a very short piece, but I said, let me mute the drums and something else and see how it feels, right? Dropping the bottom uh, uh, from the track. And it sounded very cool. But then it comes back in. Comes back in. Alright, so this C section has a couple of surprises. One surprise is that that we drop the bottom from it. And the other thing, you may not have noticed it, but the the sax guitar is playing at a higher octave here. Cool. Oops, my computer is struggling there with uh, with all this. And I believe I automated the, the volume of the sax guitar just a little bit. Oops, Daisy. Did I? Or did I not? automated the volume of the guitar down when it's playing the higher octave because I, I felt like the, the higher octave gives it more high frequencies, more presence, so it felt like too loud uh, when coming or when changing from this section into the, the next one. Great. So this is the E section with a couple of surprises there. And finally, this is what I would consider the outro. And I'm just dropping stuff out of the arrangement. The electric guitar is gone. Nice, and kind of stopping short like the same as the intro or similar to that. Cool. Let's see what else we've got here. Let me see if there are some questions. Thank you for your videos. Yeah. It's always a pleasure to make these videos and to help people out. Synthwave Elements and your indie dance and your tech house. Yeah, that's very cool. I use Serum and made a fat line base patch for it. Sure. Yeah. Like, uh, like I said at the beginning, every time I get my hands on a synth, whatever it is, I try to recreate the fat line base patch. And I have like a preset for that on each of the synths that I own, and I just love trying to get that sound. And I uh, wonder if I can make a patch in Vital or Serum. Yeah, it, it certainly it, it works in, in Vital. I've done it before. That is comparable. Yeah, in Vital, it works very well. Cool. So that brings us to the end of our live stream. So before we wrap up for the night, I'm going to play the whole thing 
from top to bottom without any commentary, then come back and see if there are any questions and send you off on your way, my friends. Give me a second to open this thing up. Like so. All right, here we go. All right, my friends, thank you very much for joining this live stream. And thank you much, thank you very much, Stargazers, for that comment about you saying that I'm your one of your favorite educators on YouTube. I do try to go to great lengths to go where no other man or woman has gone before, <laughs> doing research on, on these things and just really trying to show you everything that I can to help out so you can make the music that's in your heart. That's my ultimate goal all right my friends so if nothing else i'm gonna let you guys go thank you so much for joining and i'll catch you in the next one thank you very much my friends keep synth waving keep synth wave alive